Hi everyone, it's your boy Zach, and what a nice, pleasant little surprise. Uh, so, um, sometimes when I'm kind of in a rush or I'm busy, I'll I'll, I'll stack the deck, uh, choosing books I think that will be cringe is always easy. I don't have to think about cringe. Oh, what's going to be the title? Um, a, a solid book is harder to review and harder to come up with an interesting title. And titles are really, really important. Um, so, uh, uh, oh, and that's where this title comes from. I've actually been waiting to use this title for a while. And uh, I think it's because uh, I listened to uh, Doug Ernst and Englantine in the uh, in uh, the last 24 hours and I got it got really nostalgic it took me back it took me back to April of last year oh my god how many things have happened since April of last year <laughs> feels like 10 years worth of things have happened in the last what is that 18 months or so uh, but uh, those are uh, uh, Doug Ernst uh, Englantine and then Captain Cummings those are kind of like the, they're not kind of those are the OGs of Comicsgate before Comicsgate was even Comicsgate, when it was just some people uh, on the, the the internet who were kind of calling out some, some stuff and nonsense, um, uh, and uh, catching heat because of it. Because uh, uh, and I'm I'm about to start doing some videos on these older uh, uh, zines from the 80s and 90s, but um, the internet, <laughs> boy, it's really looking like the internet was a mistake. <laughs> I always say this. Do you ever notice in the sci-fi movies how little people use computers and communication? Like, they're all about, like, doing things in real. Oh, let's, let's go down to the planet. Let's do this. Oh, like, they're never just... How, how often do you just sit to stare at your phone for hours? And it makes everyone weird. Um, but uh, there used to be actual criticism. There would be zines, and they, and they would say, this is good, this is bad, for this reason, for that reason. Kind of like what we're doing. Um, the deal is back then you had to learn to deal with that. You had to learn to deal with whatever amazing heroes or comics interview. You'd start your career and people would say, oh, this new guy, he's not very good. He's just copying uh, Roger Stern or something like that. And you'd have to, you know, not just get good, as they say, uh, but you'd have to um, uh, learn to deal with the slings and arrows of criticism, sometimes very harsh criticism. Um, what happened with the Internet is it became things became more direct you could tell you something and like uh doug ernst saw uh dan slot would find out about you try to hem you up try to get you in trouble with your work it was very very direct um but they were not able to prevent this directness uh the more critical magazines tended to go by the the wayside and then the uncritical ones lasted longer and then the completely uh God, what's that word subservient basically ass kissers i can't think of a better word so the, what you have right now and it's very obvious if you go to any of the quote news sites is basically a tongue bath um if you're on the right side of the history you have the right politics if you if uh X, Y, and Z, you will get constant adulation. And pros became very, very addicted to that. That's why they reacted so strongly when these these incel, interloper, alt-right... I'm being sarcastic on all this. Um, uh, when people started saying things they didn't want to hear because they got used to not hearing that for about a decade or so, basically, the way to get a writing job or an editor job was to become a reviewer. And what are the reviews? They're all just blazingly positive. Um, go go look at any of the review sites or some of the uh, less, uh, I don't know what you call it. <laughs> I just keep coming back to the word ass kissing. Uh, basically, ass kissing doesn't get you in trouble. It doesn't get you copyright strikes. It doesn't get you labeled some horrible thing. It doesn't get them looking up who your employer is. You kiss ass, you're, you might not make a little money, but you're safe. Um, and uh, I totally forget what my point was. Oh, just going back to the good old days when things started with the, you know. So, uh, so I can totally hear Captain Cummings singing, you know, bump, like, bump, 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 this is how you do it. I can, I can totally hear him saying that in my head. But anyway, so my point was, geez, four minutes. Oh, that wasn't that long. Um, I thought this was going to be an easy roast. 
Um, this X-Men Black, it's a five-issue miniseries. It's just basically a one-shot about the villains in each one, and then there's a backup story about Apocalypse in all of them that's quite good. Uh, but the other ones have been, like, really... Uh, that the, the Mystique one was not just one of the worst comics I've read, but one of the most disturbing. In this day of hashtag Me Too, in this day of, you know, Kavanaugh, it was an ugly, evil story about fantasizing about how fun it would be to be able to make false allegations against mostly men and ruin their entire lives. Tone deaf. Um, uh, what was the other one? I'm trying to remember what the other one. There was, oh, Magneto. That one was bad, but it wasn't horribly bad. It was just very disappointing because it was Chris Claremont's, one of his big returns to the X-Men franchise. This one, Juggernaut, I got confused with another one. I think I got it confused with this uh, Emma Frost one that comes out next week. Uh, or, uh, yeah, next week. Uh, because people were showing this kind of, like, rip-off Frank Quitely style where she has, like, a million wrinkles in her face. Uh, w- women are hard to draw because, especially if they're supposed to be younger or very pretty, because you can always just throw some more lines onto any guy's face. It's fine. It makes them look more rugged. But women, it's, it's one extra line you just threw 20 years onto her. Um, but it, I thought that this is this one. I should have known, but it wasn't. This is a book... Uh, it's uh, Juggernaut by uh, Robbie Thompson, whose name kind of rings a bell. I think I remember reading something he wrote that I liked. Sean Crystal, no impact, no idea. Um, but uh, this was fantastic. I, I can't believe how good this was. This Darren Shan is the editor. For once, I'm not seeing, like, Marvel's gotten really, really cheap really broke um and uh they just used the name to trick people into working for sub poverty wages so that's why when heather antos was there you saw her on like an every single book they were just throwing every single thing here your editor co-edit like 15 books um i don't see this darren shan on a million different books and i think that might be quite crucial because it lets him concentrate um but uh, anyway it started off and i thought it might be bad because I've got to say, I'm calling shenanigans on the perspective in this main panel. Uh, this sh- I thought it was a sentinel. Because the X-Mansion is right there. You can pull stuff like this if this is a, a hill and that's under depression and the-, the perspective is a little off. But this is a giant. This is not somebody... I mean, a giant like 60 feet tall, not 10. Like the Juggernaut. But basically, this is... And I think some people are going to have qualms with the style. I've got to say, even though I would say this is indie style, it's two things. Number one, Marvel has experimented with indie styles going way back to the 80s. I mean, Tony Salmons and Jeff Purvis were not house artists. They were not typical style of the time. They were very uh, different. They were very shocking at the time. And Marvel gave them both multiple attempts to kind of get people to accept their style it didn't really happen but they gave it the old college try i think jeff purvis got a year and change on the incredible hulk tony salmons i don't remember him having a a run but i remember him popping up to in in a lot of things and they really gave him a chance and people didn't quite pick up on it um it was a little too different but um this one i mean the blocking with the armpit was weird but uh at first i was like oh are we getting some more black mask trash but no um the art actually gets better as it goes by one of the things i love is the guy actually drawing the sound effects and of course he does this like throughout there's some really good ones look at that one right there but what we get is a very very old school 80s and 90s style x-men story where I mean, this used to happen all the time. You would focus on them, one character and you would show previously unnoticed or perhaps non-existing depth in the character. And this is this is about Kane. Uh, he gets his power from the uh, crystal of Sidorak. Sidorak is a, is a demon god uh, who's based around rage. Um, he's not just he didn't just give this power for no reason. He's supposed to build up to be kind of a destroyer. And then we get a hint into his childhood and this, uh, you know, this rage he's always had. It's it's very interesting because he's basically being tested for rage and uh, tested for adequacy because he uh, he got defeated by, I believe, uh, female Thor, Jane uh, Foster Thor. 
And um, so, but I mean, look at this. So he ends up having to fight some uh, demons and as well as Sidorak himself. And uh, you get uh, this really interesting, uh, usually this would have been done in like a 10 page backup story in the back of classic X-Men or it would have been in one of the annuals. But uh, like I said, when things are so bad right now, good seems great. And I would actually say this is at the high end of good. Um, what does he say? He says, uh, I've been a lot of things, bully, hero, bad, good, strong, weak, stupid, smart. None of it mattered. All that mattered, all that's ever mattered is rage. That's who I am, who I have always been before you, before that stupid gen. And now it's time to let all my rage out once and for all. I'm free now, free. So this is him. So there is a sadness to it that he basically admits all I am is rage. Um, uh, one of the things I kept thinking about is one of the biggest you know, differences between a hero story and a villain story is you see this, the, the, the villain struggles but he, he struggles for something that is very personal, it's only for himself, it's selfish, and it's also sad. Um, uh, we saw this also in the, uh, the what if about uh, uh, Flash Thompson as uh, Spider-Man, although he did kind of have a growth moment. Uh, Kane doesn't really have a growth moment, but it's more of an identity. He's like, this is who I am, you strip away everything, I'm someone whose whole life is rage. And so the, the god is like, all right, you know, that'll do that's basically <laughs> i wanted to make sure you weren't soft and you aren't and um i like this how he goes um why are you still here sidorak's trick is over seeing his younger self he's like because i was never part of his trick i am part of you and now that i'm free i'm hungry let us spread fear and rage and perhaps one day we shall find the other seven gems and make sidorak bend to our will bam and look they he put the end and the steps going down from the temple Man, like, like I said, bringing it back to the beginning in the song, this is how you do it. You, you don't have to get that fancy. This story is going to age. Like I was talking about those these horrible SJW things. They age like freaking salad. This thing's going to age like wine. If this would have come out in the 80s, 90s, it would have blended in and, and still be good. When you, If you read this in 20 or 30 years, it's still going to be meaningful. It's still going to be solid. Basic human drives, desires, and fears. This is what stories are made of. Not getting at, even with your Twitter enemies. Um, and then we get the backup story with um, Apocalypse. This one had more payout. The other one seemed a little padded. Like I kind of got the idea in the first like two pages, and then there was eight more. But this one was great. We, we, we got to see um, Apocalypse be... Uh, basically completely devolved he, he actually describes what he is an aphasic simian I think it is it was, it was very important for me aphasic simian being um, and then he figures out a way even with his um, uh, intelligence basically destroyed he still has a little bit of cunning so he's able to flip script as they say but uh, man I gotta tell you very very happy with this uh, episode or issue of X-Men Black it is 100% good. The whole thing. And I think it might have to do with this guy, who I don't know anything about him except for he edits good comics, Darren Shan, uh, actually spending more time, concentrating more, uh, not editing 15 books uh, at the same time while also spending half the day on Twitter. As, uh, you did good. You did good. Keep up the good work. So anyway, thanks for watching. Subscribe. Make sure you're still subscribed. Hit the bell for notifications. Thanks to everyone giving to the Patreon and in the Indiegogo. You're funding original content. And I'll have another uh, new comic review up later tonight.